I think it's interesting, we're talking today about this progression of curators, um, and it is sort of a, a noble succession, right? That, that is a word we can use it in two ways here. Um, but also this succession of great uh, collectors and supporters of the museum. And I remember the last talk that I gave here was early in 2019, um, and it was about the Perrys and the Perry collection. And um, I told Frank Bonsack, he almost made me cry earlier talking about the Perrys. They were very close to me. Um, but it's wonderful to be back now and to talk about uh, Bill and everything that Bill has done. And unlike the Perrys, it's great that Bill is here. I'm sure the Perrys are with us in spirit, but Bill is actually here and we know that he can hear us talking about all the great things that he has done. So thank you, Bill. And you can see I have this long, overly long title for my talk, but uh, we're talking about a, comp a complicated vase that belongs to a group of complicated vases. The, the one name from antiquity that is connected to this group of objects is Anacreon, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Anacreon. And then, of course, we have Mr. Zawadzki, so A to Z seemed like a natural thing to say. And I started thinking of all the letters in the alphabet between, and there were ways I could tie in lots and lots of other words as well. Um, but some of you know I can go on and on. Uh, so here we go. This is the Zawadzki stamnos, and a stamnos is a sort of unusual shape. You won't see this shape in every collection that you visit. In fact, there are some very distinguished collections that do not have a stamnos. There are only, um, I would say, fewer than 500 red figure stamnoi in captivity, as, as my teacher, John Papadopoulos, would say. Um, they just don't survive, but that's partly because there weren't so many made, right? They seem to have been made specifically, or mostly at least, for the export market, to be made in Athens and sent off to Etruria. And I see Jeremy Bundrick is an expert in this area and, and also an expert in ancient music. So I have to tread lightly here because I'm talking about things that she might know more about. Um, but I remember when I arrived here, Bill would point to this vase proudly and say, you know, not every museum has a red figure stamnos. And, and that's true. Um, there aren't so many. We also don't know a lot about them. This is an ancient name an ancient vessel name, we know that there was a kind of pot called a stamnos in antiquity, but we can't be entirely sure that it was this kind of pot. And if you look at it, you can see it's, it's sort of narrow and tall, right? It's, a, it's an elegant shape, I think, um, and sort of a medium-sized opening, not a constricted opening like an amphora, which we use to store things, or an even more constricted opening for valuable things like oil, but not a wide open opening, like for a crater, for mixing, right? So this is sometimes called a storage vessel, sometimes called a mixing vessel, sometimes called a serving vessel, which means we don't really know. Here you can see why it's called the Zawadzki Stamnos. Um, in 1999, a few years after this was acquired by the museum, it was published in the American Journal of Archaeology, the preeminent journal in our field, um, and Margaret Miller, the, the, a different Margaret Miller, <laughs> Not this Margaret Miller, sorry. But Margie, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you for coming. Um, and you can see the title that that, that Margaret Miller used, right? Reexamining Transvestism in Archaic and Classical Athens, the Zawadzki Stamnos. And you might say, what is transvestite, what, what, what sorts of transvestites do we see here, right? It's a little bit difficult to see if you're not used to looking at lots and lots of Greek vases, right? So I show you for comparison the, the vessel on the right from the Noble Collection, which shows these three women, menads really, right? The followers of Dionysus. The one in the center is holding a lyre, a musical instrument. The one on the left, a cantharos, a wine cup, as well as a thyrsus, and the one on the right, a, um, a torch. But you can see their drapery comes all the way down to the ground, right? And they're wearing two different garments, a lightweight one underneath and a heavier one on top, and it goes down to their feet. And this is how we see women frequently dressed in classical Athens in an attic red figure. It's not usually how we see men. But if you look at the image on the far left, the front side, we would say the obverse of the Zawadzki Stamnos, we see again, a woman in the center um, holding 
the same musical instrument, but on either side, a bearded figure with this full length dress, and moreover, their heads are covered, which is very, very unusual. Usually women have their heads covered, not men. Um, and so people have said, well, I'll get into what people have said. These are women dressed as men, or maybe these are men dressed as women, or my daughter said to me the other day, maybe they're women with men's heads, right? We have all kinds of <laughs> mythological creatures in, in ancient Greece. I hadn't seen that one published yet, but Isos. Um, and then on the back side of the vase, we have three young men revelers and the one in the center holding a wineskin. So, so far so good for the most part, except why are these men dressed in this unusual way? As another point of comparison, I show you, and I'm proud about this, this is a red figure vase that is new to the Cleveland Museum of Art. We didn't used to have a red figure Stamnos, and now we do. Um, and the one in Cleveland is a little bit later than the one in Tampa. And it has a similar scene of revelry, right? We've got two musicians in this case in, in Cleveland. Um, but here the revelers are almost nude, which is normal, right? After you have a symposium with your buddies, you drink a lot of wine, you remove maybe some of your clothes, and you have a, a riotous good time on your way back, right? Carousing through the streets with more wine and music, right? So, but again, these revelers, very different from the ones on the Zawadzki Stamnos. Uh, again, just a close up, right? See how their heads are covered? That's very unusual for, for men in red figure vases at, at this time. But there's a whole group, as I said, there's a group of about 50 or so of these vases, depending exactly what um, characteristics you're looking for. Um, and so we, here we see the same shape, on a vase in Madrid, and here we've got even more of these cross-dressed or fully draped, right? There are lots of different ways that we can describe them of these revelers. And they have not only um, the full dress and the head covering and the wine vessels, some of these guys even have parasols, sunshades, right? Something that is not associated with a manly man in classical Athens. So this is something unusual that's going on. Or we have on this one, and I'm gonna show this image several times because this has become sort of the one that is most frequently brought forward when we talk about this. And there you see the name that I mentioned, Anacreon, but with a question mark, right? I'm not sure if this is Anacreon, but he has certain characteristics that scholars have come to associate with him, right? The turban or the sacos on the head, the long beard, the lyre of this particular type with these long curving arms, the long Keton and Himation, and moreover, shoes and boots, right? Usually our revelers would be barefoot. So who's this guy, Anacreon? We know a lot about him. We have um, lots of surviving texts that are said to be written by Anacreon, and probably even more surviving texts that seem to be sort of paying homage to Anacreon. And you can see some of the important points um, in, in his life. Um, he is from Teos, which is on the Ionian coast here, but had to move together with most of his um, countrymen up here to Abdera, and then back down here to the island of Samos, where he served as a lyric poet at the court of the tyrant um, Polycrates. After Polycrates' death, he was taken under the wing of another tyrant, or the son of a tyrant, I should say, Hipparchus, the son of one of the sons of Pisistratus. Not only did he invite Anacreon to Athens, he sent a Pentaconter, a 50 oared warship, right? Like, it's like sending an F-16 to go fetch a poet and bring him back to your court. Um, and he spends some time then in Athens until um, the ousting of the Pisistratids and then off. And, and then we're not really exactly sure what happens. There's at least one later author who tells us that he lived to old age and died at the age of 85, choking on a grape, which is perfect for a poet who was um, deeply enamored of, of love and wine, right? It's probably not true, but that's the story that we're told. We even have a sculpture that is said to be Anacreon, or several sculptures. Um, the image on the far left is with restorations, the, the two larger ones in the center without restorations. This is in uh, the Glyptotech in Copenhagen. And the reason that people think, or the reasons that people think this 
is Anacreon, is number one. Pausanias tells us there was a statue of Anacreon on the Athenian Acropolis. And he tells us a little bit about it. Um, and you can see this guy looks as if maybe he's singing when he's drunk, which is what Pausanias tells us, right? He was probably holding a lyre. Um, and moreover, we have some partial sculptures with a very similar uh, face and hairstyle and beard. And the one in the Capitoline Museums in Rome is inscribed Anacreon Lyricos, Anacreon the Lyric Poet, right? So scholars have put these together and said, that might be Anacreon. We also have some vases. This vase, soon after it was acquired in the 1840s, was said to be perhaps a representation of Anacreon, right? Because if you think about someone who loved to play poetry or recite poetry and play music, and we hear from some other sources that he had a little pet dog that he was with all the time, right? So perhaps these are Anacreon, but you'll notice that's very different from the slides I was showing before, right? This guy's almost naked, more like the sculpture. The one on the, on the far right is more like the ones that we've been talking about. That belongs to this larger group. We also have this great cup in London, um, which has not a reveler, but a symposiast, right? He's reclining on his couch, holding that same lyre. His mouth is even open. His head is tilted back. He's singing. And there are letters here. And they say, Hipparchos Kalos. Hipparchos is beautiful. Well, Hipparchos is the name of that son of the tyrant who sent the Pentaconter to bring him back to Athens. So maybe this is an Acreon, right? And he's saying Hipparchos is beautiful, right? He knows who's paying his way, right? And, and he wants to make his patrons happy. But again, that's very, very different from this. And so we have this ongoing, long, ongoing, and still unresolved debate among scholars. Does an Acreon look like that, or does he look like this, right? Two very different ways of depicting someone. Maybe they're both right, right? Maybe sometimes he dressed one way, maybe sometimes the other way. We also have a few images of other famous poets, maybe even more famous poets, right? So there's this great vase in Munich, and this is inscribed, right? The man with the long beard and that same kind of liar that we've seen, here is uh, indicated, his name is indicated above his head, Alcaeus, another famous lyric poet. And I love this part, there are, are notes coming out of his mouth, right? He's singing or reciting poetry, right? And beside him, Sappho, who's probably an even more famous poet, right? So we know that these artists, these vase painters, were familiar with these poets, and they were representing them on their vases. And we have a few more, three more that I know of, that seem to show Anacreon. And again, it's a mix. It's inconsistent. So this is maybe the most important one because this belongs to that same group. Unfortunately, it's really fragmentary, right? But this is that same shape that we saw earlier, a calyx crater. And you can see this guy um, has his head covered. He's holding that, that same parasol. And he also has words coming out of his mouth. He's singing, right? And somebody on this vase is holding that same kind of lyre, and the lyre is labeled Anacreon. Does that mean it's Anacreon's lyre? Does that mean this is Anacreon? Or just this is the kind of lyre that Anacreon uses? These are all sort of open questions. We also have this one, right? Again, holding the lyre and singing, but not fully draped, not with the head covering, right? And he's labeled Anacreon. And then finally, on this unfortunately poorly preserved Lekithos um, in Syracuse, a guy in the center holding that lyre. He does seem to be dressed in this curious way with his head covered, and he too holds the lyre and is labeled Anacreon. But the group goes back even earlier, even into black figures. So we have vases like these dating as early as maybe 520 BC that show these figures. They're not labeled Anacreon, but they are dressed in this unusual way. And I love the guy on the plate, right? He's doing this really impossible kind of dance, I think, while still holding his wine cup up above his head, not spilling any wine, right? And you can see black figure and red figure with a lot of those same characteristics. 
And I just want to run through a few more of these examples. There are lots of them, more than 50. And I can't show them all, right? We would be here all afternoon. Uh, but this one also has in, an inscription naming a known poet Polyphrasmon. So the question of whether these depict a specific poet or a type of poet, I think, is an open one. Just a few more examples. This is one of my favorite ones in the Getty Museum, right? They're encircling the entire vase, and we even have under the handle uh, a nice column crater draped with garlands, right? And so this is all connected, and this is important, this is all connected to the world of Dionysus and drinking wine and reveling and having a good time, right? And so maybe you are dressing up, maybe you are reciting poetry, maybe you are dressing in a way as a woman, or maybe you're dressing in just an extravagant way and sort of lavishing in the joys in the world of Dionysus. There's another important vase in the series that's also in Cleveland. And this one adds an, a new element. This one, he even has earrings, right? And no self-respecting Greek man wears earrings. So this is like over the top. You're definitely not dressing like a regular Greek. Whether you're dressing like a woman or like an Easterner or somehow in homage to Dionysus, again, I'm not certain. Um, but lots of eminent scholars before me have weighed in on this, right? So the first important publication of the Cleveland vase says, these are men dressed as women, and they're not engaged in a sacred rite. That was another argument that was put forward. The reason they're holding these umbrellas, these parasols, is because of a rather obscure festival that we know about in Athens. But that seems to have been debunked. So these are revelers, right? And they're revelers of a particular type. And again, just to point out that this guy whom, whom we've seen several times, right? This is the one about whom John Beasley, Sir John Beasley wrote. And he said, number one, these vases represent a comos, a kind of revel. Number two, when one of them is playing a lyre, he is an acreon. Number three, a lone figure like this, like the guy on the vase in Boston all by himself, he is an acreon. And even if an acreon is not there, the others are the boon companions of an acreon. And this boon companion, right, that's not a way that we normally speak um, in the States, but in Oxford, where Sir Beasley worked, right, that, that was an appropriate way to, to call them, so much so that one of Beasley's successors, Sir John Boardman, published an article with Donna Kurtz entitling these vases, The Booners. All these guys are the Booners. They are the boon companions of Anacreon. So where does this leave us with the Zawadzki stamnos? You can see our list of um, these sort of unusual characteristics is a little bit shorter when we look at the Zawadzki stamnos, right? They, they still have the covered hair, they still have the long beard. The Barbatos lyre is on the vase, but it's not held by one of these guys. It's held by this woman who's not dressed unusually, but they have the long dress. Um, I think the Zawadzki stamnos is at the very end of this tradition that begins around 520 and ends around 460, 450 BC. It's sort of the I don't know if it's the very last one that we have, but it's certainly one of the last ones that we have. And it's perhaps a little less emphatic than those earlier ones, as if we're sort of easing in to a way of representing uh, the Comos more like on the later one that I showed you initially in Cleveland. Uh, a scholar called Robin Osborne has suggested the vases, the anacreontic ones, the Booners, show a sort of other way of partying, right? If you bought this vase and we're gonna use it with your buddies, in all likelihood, you are not going to dress like that, whereas the one on the right is more like how you might see yourself, right? So it's a little bit less extravagant, but still, there's one thing about the Zawadzki one that is unusual. It's one of the only ones I know that pairs this sort of unusual dress with the wineskin. And the wineskin is something that we associate with really um, unrestrained drinking, right? We see satyrs just drinking straight out of the wineskin, right? And so I think there is this interesting um, 
this interesting situation going on where we're, we're not quite sure where we're going with our scenes of the symposium. We know that we enjoy our wine, we know that we enjoy our dancing, um, and, and we know that we will enjoy doing it with these important works of art. And I think that's a good place to leave it and say thank you, Bill, for giving this vase to the museum. And if we have time, I would invite everyone to go upstairs and have a look. Thank you.